some military historians concentrate on strategy, some on equipment. I concentrate on people. It's people in the military that I, that I get interested in. So my master's thesis was a, well, no, no my PhD dissertation was a biography of a, of a Coast Guardman that everybody had forgotten. Uh, but now they, I like to think I gave him credit. There are big ships named for him now. There's an award named for him. So, and this is another hero I never heard about. Uh, that I want to talk to you about today, Warren Gill. Uh, and the reason I got interested in studying this is I work with, the, there are, the Coast Guard has about four historians, civilian historians they hire full time to work in Coast Guard history. And one of them back east does a lot of writing. He called me up and said, Doug, I've got a person I want to look into and you could probably look him better than I could because he's from Lebanon, Oregon. I said, I know where that is. That's not too far away. So I accepted the job, started doing research, went to Lebanon several times, looked through the papers, and I was more and more amazed the more I found out about him. And I, when, I, when uh, Bida Kaddish wanted me to give a title for this, I said, well, just call him the epitome of a veteran. And then I looked at my dictionary and said, epitome means actually technically someone who sort of represents a typical person. And I'm not sure he's the typical veteran. I, uh, he's a little more than that, I guess. And where to retitle re this, I'd probably call it Warren Gill, veteran extraordinaire, because he does his extraordinary things as a veteran. Anybody from Lebanon here? No, okay. He's a bit, yeah, well, anyway, we'll get to that later. So let me, let me begin. He uh, was a lifelong resident of Lebanon. He was born there in 1912, the youngest of three children. Uh, his father was a dentist. And his mother had been, I think, a music major in college, but was uh, a mother and, and housewife at that time. Now, interesting life, he was, never had problems in school, but when he was about to begin his junior year in high school, with his parents' permission, he essentially took a leave of absence from high school, drove to Portland, they drove him up to Portland and became a deck cadet on a U.S. merchant ship sailing to the Far East. And uh, jumped on different ships back and forth for one year, came back after that year, resumed high school, did his, finished his junior or senior, graduated with no apparently in, in bad effects, and then went to the University of Oregon and graduated from their law school. That's the house he grew up in. It still stands there. Uh, this is a few years ago. It's not nearly as nice as it was when he lived there, obviously, because it's now pretty old. It was built about 1900. This is the University of Oregon. Anybody know what building that is at the University of Oregon? This is the Knight Library, the largest library on campus. It was built while he was a student there. It was built between 1935 and 1937. He graduated from the law school in 1939. Uh, and shortly after graduating from the law school, he passed the Oregon bar uh, exam but decided rather to stay in Oregon to initially practice law, he took position at a New York City law firm. So left Lebanon and went to New York City, which in the 1940s, that's what it looked like. Found that online too. And he worked for an admiralty law firm. An admiralty law firm is a firm that deals with the law of the sea, ship, anything related to shipping, uh, anything uh, nautical goes to them. And in an interview once said, he was especially proud that one, while he was at that law firm, he was a part of a team that took a case before the U.S. Supreme Court, and they won their case. So he was very proud of that. The problem with doing research, a lot of World War II photographs you just can't find. And I couldn't contact any of his, I couldn't locate any of his descendants to get photographs they might have. Uh, so, but while he was living in New York City, there was a young woman who had grown up in Los Angeles who was a concert singer. Uh, and he named her, he met her, I should say, and they started dating. Her name was Vadna Scott, V-A-D-N-E. I assume it's pronounced Vadna or Vedna. Uh, and they started dating, and they actually traveled around. They both enjoyed music and were actually attending a concert in Baltimore, Maryland on Sunday, December 7th, 1941. And they didn't learn about Pearl Harbor attack until after they left the concert, because don't interrupt a concert for something like that, I guess. Uh, 
So they d does that. They get married in January 1942, the two of them. And then Warren Gill decides, well, I've got experience in the Merchant Marine. He goes to volunteer to serve as an officer in the Merchant Marine after his, based on his one-year experience. He's got a law degree. Uh, but they decide he's needed more in the Coast Guard. So he will be, uh, instead of going to the Merchant Marine, he will join the Coast Guard. And that's the emblem that commissioned officers wear in their hats. That's the thing there, 1790, when it was founded. By the way, the Coast Guard is the oldest continuous seagoing armed force this nation has. The Navy was here first in the continental, during the American Revolution. When the US got its independence, Congress to save money, because they didn't have much money, disestablished the Continental Navy. Uh, and so what they did was they, for the first number of years until 1790, they, there was no Navy. They didn't form the Navy till seven, the U.S. Navy till 1793. Uh, so, claim to fame of the Coast Guard old is continuous. But anyway, just a technicality. But the Navy, of course, is much bigger. Now he's commissioned as a Coast Guard officer. He's 30 years old, which is not unusual for World War II, but would be unusual today. His first assignment is the USS Samuel Chase. APA 26, APA means it's an auxiliary vessel that carries personnel, it's a troop carrier plane. In other words, all it does is carry troops or Marines from one location to another. Uh, they can go fairly fast, but they're not a, a battleship, they're a, a, tr a personnel carrier. And this is more than 350 Navy ships manned by the Coast Guard in World War II. The Navy grows very rapidly with all sorts of ships they don't have enough people to man all their ships. So 31 of these ships will be completely manned by Coast Guard officers and crew. So it'll be a Coast Guard ship, but it still belongs to the Navy, still is known as the USS, uh, but it's Coast Guard manned. And on this ship, which will take troops uh, to the, close to the landing and then lower boats over the side to land them on the beach for an amphibious landing, he will be assigned as the assistant beach officer and that's the person that will go in on one of the first boats and be on the beach to, like a beach master doing today, telling them, you go here, you go here, everything else. After a short stop in Canada, as they're sailing over, uh, the chase crosses the Atlantic. It will take place in the first amphibious landing of World War II, which takes place not in the Pacific, but it takes place in Morocco. Morocco, owned and operated by the French at this point in time, so the amphibious landings made here, if you've ever seen the great Hollywood movie Casablanca, that's during this period where the French are still nominally in control, but the, the Germans are there more in control. So it's not too bad of a landing. They land there. It's the first, also this is the European North African theater of World War II, much different than the Pacific theater, which take place roughly the same time. Now after this landing, uh, and by the way, the Coast Guard had a good reputation for working with small boats and for amphibious landings. So they will, in the Pacific and in Europe, will carry the Marines and the Army to the, many of their beach landings that happen. And after they land in Morocco, and they'll be there a little while, and the Army is uh, going to fight its way over to Tunisia here, trying to eventually get to Italy. Warren Gill is, is made a a trainer, he's training people in landing operations. Both the Army people and the Coast Guard and the Navy people, he becomes some, somewhat quite well at that, so he does that. Uh, and what they planned, what the grand strategy is, uh, during World War II, Germany is fighting war against the Soviet Union on this front, against Great Britain over here, but Great Britain can't do much to invade from this way. And the Soviet Union, which is one of our allies in World War II, is putting pressure on the, their other allies, say, we need to open a front someplace else. Now, the US would like to have invaded France and end it quicker, but there's not enough US assets or people in, in England to do that. So they say, OK, we can't do this yet, but we'll invade this way and try to invade it through Italy and open a front down there as well. And the other reason for that is the American intelligence said the Italians were not nearly as fierce of fighters as the Germans were, so might be a little less resistance there. 
So they, they land, and then they're going to make an invasion from Tunisia over to Sicily, a little island that looks like the toe on the boot, or just off the boot of, of Italy there. That's Sicily. Uh, and they will make that landing in July of 1943 which is actually the, the opening engagement of the United States. Uh, well, I take that back. That's the opening engagement in, of the Allied invasion of, of Sicily. It's an amphibious landing, and at that landing, Gill is made the officer in charge of the uh, small craft that land army troops from off the water into Sicily. There's an island there, okay. And that's where his landing will take place in Gila. This is where APAs will come off here, discharge their people in boats, and they will go in there. Paratroopers will be dropped behind the lines. This, by the way, if, you know, if you've studied or read anything about World War II history, uh, they learn a lot at this amphibious landing. To make an amphibious landing, you have bombers bombing behind the lines. You have Navy gunboats or battleships up here lobbing artillery in trying to soften up the defenders over here. And then at, and then at the end, uh, you, send, uh, you drop paratroopers in the back lines, and you drop uh, amphibious people ashore. Well, uh, there are U.S. troops carrying, U.S. planes carrying uh, U.S. paratroopers in, and they fly over the Navy ships, which are offshore, bombarding. It's nighttime, which is when you want to land so nobody can see you, and the Navy people are a little gun trigger happy because the Germans have been bombing them and attacking them. So they start shooting at the planes in the sky going over. The planes they're shooting at are old DC-3s called C-47s. They are unarmed, unarmored, slow-moving targets because you can't drop a paratroop unless you're going fairly low and slow, perfect for the Germans to shoot you down. Uh, and so because it makes a little ill will between the Navy and the Army Air Force when the, and the Army at that point in time, but as a result of that, they changed the painting. After this amphibious landing, every US warplane in Europe will have big white stripes on its wings. So you can identify it as an American plane, not a, a German one. So if you see a picture of a, or in a museum that has a plane that has the white stripes, you know that was from after the invasion of Sicily. Just a simple shooting the problem there. Uh, now this, Gill is placed in command of a flotilla of small craft, okay, which uh, land members and the person in charge of this whole operation for the Americans, a colorful general named George S. Patton. Famous movie with George C. Scott in that one. Uh, so that's who's commanding all the army troops. When they begin landing the troops, a storm strikes, a, a, a Mediterranean storm with high waves. And uh, Warren Gill will later, later write home and tell his family uh, the weather was so bad that when the army troops hit the ground, a good percentage of them were seasick. It's just those little landing craft were bouncing up and down in the waves. It was really bad weather. Uh, but there's not much fighting going on because it's mainly the Italians defending. They don't have the equipment or the, or the training that the, the German troops will have later on. The uh, Gill's landing craft is the first one to reach the beach, touch the shore. Uh, later, he, he takes his crew and their landing craft off the beach uh, to direct all the succeeding attack waves for 12 straight hours until the Sicily beachhead is solidified. And in this landing, there's, they drop the lines down the side of the, the APA there. They, it's out of the water quite a ways. And those little boats go back and forth. Gill's flotilla he's in charge of loses not a single American in that amphibious landing. No one falls overboard and is drowned. No one gets killed. Uh, so it's a success in that sense, although he said it's probably as much due, he said it's due to luck, but he had to give some credit to the air cover the U.S. Army Air Force has provided them as well. That summer, he'll be promoted from Ensign to Lieutenant J.G. Lieutenant J.G. is the first thing as a first lieutenant in the land forces. And he would receive after that the Legion of Merit medal for his leadership in that landing. And that's the picture, only picture I could find of him. That's where he's receiving the Legion of Merit. That's the medal you see there with his wife standing nearby. This is actually uh, after he comes back from the war when they, 
the, the, catches up with him there. Here's a citation for this first legion of merit. That was presented to him, quote, for meritorious conduct in the pre-assault training of the officers and men for small boat operations and as commander of an assault force during the assault on Sicily. His effort and enthusiasm inspired, inspired in the small boat flotillas a spirit of determination that was largely responsible for their success. End of citation. Uh, after they make this landing, they return back to Tunisia. Their next combat will be at Salerno on the, this coast of, the west coast of Italy there. It's a 328-foot LST, or landing craft tank, and it will support operations by carrying tanks, vehicles, cargo, landing troops, especially in a, a, a beach that has no piers or docks to do that. And this is a picture of one of those underway. They get their name because when they come close to the beach, they can build the Army, Army engineers can build a little floating dock out there, and the bow comes open, just splits open wide, and you can drive trucks and tanks right at the inside of this. Uh, anything you need can come that way. So they're heavily used in D-Day later on in World War II. That's how all the equipment gets ashore, but they're used in, in Sicily first when these come ashore at this point. Uh, because they're supposed to land in shallow water and hopefully if they don't have a pier, they can just get close enough, they can drop down. They can uh, shift, the front of the bow is made uh, especially lights so they can get in as a flat bottom, which helps you slide up on the sand on the water's edge. Also makes it rough riding at sea because a flat bottom doesn't ride too well. And, it has, and how they get off, by the way, is before they get to the beach, they drop a couple anchors and let out the line. Then when they empty everything out, they turn the winches on that pulls them off the beach. They can go back and get more and come back again sometime. So you don't have to abandon it when it gets to the beach. You can pull yourself off. Uh, but because they were not very fast moving, a good target, uh, some sailors who served in them later said LST stood for low, slow targets because you don't want to be in something like that as you're facing enemy. Now, the, uh, the Coast Guard doesn't man that many LSTs, but it did man 30, 76 of them, which is less than 10% of all of them. But there are Coast Guard people in LSTs and among them is this one, 357, Warren Gill will be on. They never are given a name, even though they're long enough to have a name, they just call them LST with a number. Although in some of my research it said, I'm not sure when in the war, the crew gave it a nickname of Palermo Pete. And there's no battle of Palermo in World War II, but I don't know where it came from. I couldn't find out where they got it from, but I found that anyway. He'll be attached to this ship this LST 357 for the Battle of Salerno, where everything happens that changes his life from then on. Before they get to Salerno, he's placed in tactical command of the amphibious landing at the Battle of Salerno, the amphibious landing on the 9th of September, 1943. Its assignment, LST 357 that Gill is in, will drop British troops that they picked up in Tripoli, they'll drop them onto the beaches at Salerno, Italy. Now, unlike Sicily, where it was terrible stormy weather with high seas and storms and rain and wind, the weather was almost perfect the night they pulled into Salerno beaches. But it's gonna be a much tougher landing than it was at Sicily. Literally hours before the ships were released to make the landing, the news came that Mussolini had been overthrown, a new government's in Italy, and they declared an armistice they're no longer fighting World War II. So they're essentially pulling out of the war. So many of the Americans thought, oh, this will be easy. There's no Italians to fight against us. It's gonna be easier than even Sicily was. The reason it's tougher is they didn't realize that Hitler realized if, if Italy goes, that's gonna put Germany in jeopardy. He rushed troops, pulling them off the Eastern Front with the Soviet Union. So what they will encounter when they get there is experienced battle-hardened troops German troops that Hitler's rushed there to stop the Americans and the British from uh, getting a toehold there. So as they're coming in there, and Germany knows they're, they're on their way there because these ships don't move that fast, they have got artillery set up, they've got everything pre-positioned to do that. But when the Americans get there, they're surprised, all of them, that they're up against German and, and Germans with a lot of firepower behind them. 
uh, firing 88 millimeter artillery at them opened up. They also had put devices off the shore several miles to pick up these ships when they came in so they wouldn't be, the Germans wouldn't be surprised by the ships arriving there. And the first salvo they fired of these German artillery shells hit all their targets. I mean, they didn't miss anything. Gill is on board the LST-357, ready to get in the boats and lead the shore, lead shore. Artillery shell hits very close to them, or the shrapnel. And artillery shells, what they do is they get close and they explode and send pieces of the bomb called shrapnel, which is what kill people. So the, the metal helmets they wear are not there because they're gonna be shot by a rifle. A rifle can go through a metal helmet. They wear that because it keeps the shrapnel from hitting you there. That first explosion killed the person next to him. He'd gotten to know it was sort of his assistant that followed him around the ship and that person essentially died in his arms there. But before he can do much for him, he realizes he's been hit. Shrapnel punks both of them because it goes in all different directions pierces his lung, lower left lung. And he knows he's been hit because he feels a little girling on there, but he, instead of giving up and calling for a medic, he continues fighting on and directing the, the, the attack even though he's been severely injured. Uh, they try to pull him out, but he says, I gotta stay here and make this sure this succeeds. He stays there even though he's bleeding and lost part of a lung until uh, all the last people get in there. And at that point, then he's, the people finally drag him to cover, get a, uh, the British troop of doctors with him, the doctor looks at him, and he'll be uh, taken off and hospitalized. He'll receive his second Legion of Merit for leadership in this opposed landing at Salerno. And this one, the citation says, he's cited for his outstanding service as commander of an assault of assault forces during the amphibious operation at Salerno. Under his courageous and brilliant direction, the citation continued, the initial attack wave succeeded in effecting assigned landings. But the more the officials look at, the Navy officials look at that, they decide this is more than just the Legion of Merit. There's a, a listing of ranking of what takes the most terrorism. And they decide to award him the Navy Cross. Now the Navy Cross is the second highest award awarded to the US military for heroism in combat. Uh, only six of them were awarded to the Coast Guard. Uh, the Navy Cross is awarded to Navy, Marine Corps, and during wartime when the Coast Guard is part of the Department of the Navy, it goes to them as well. Uh, but it's, it's very difficult to get. It's above a Silver Star uh, and, and above a Legion of Merit. And I've been to a couple parades, military parades, or I shouldn't say military, I've been to local Veterans Day parades and memorial parades, and I've seen vehicles go by that had Medal of Honor and Navy Cross. It's the same thing as the Distinguished Service Cross for the Army. Uh, uh, but I've seen them both in the same car because it's, it's people that are just are that much below the Medal of Honor doing that. This is the official description in the citation. The Navy Cross is presented to Warren Calvin Gill, Lieutenant JG, U.S. Coast Guard, for extraordinary heroism in action is officer in charge of small boats for the amphibious assault on Salerno, Italy. Lieutenant Gill, while directing the lowering of small boats from USS LST-357, which was under enemy fire, was seriously wounded. Despite his wounds, he continued with utmost intrepidity to efficiently carry on his duty as commander of the assault flotillas, giving last minute instructions to the officers and crews. He then collapsed and his injuries were found to be so severe that many months of heroism, of hospitalization uh, will be required for recovery. Lieutenant Gill's heroism was an inspiration to all officers and men of the flotilla. Because of this and the patient and thorough instruction he had carried out in the landing technique throughout the training periods and the landings in Algeria and Sicily, the performance of, his, of this boat in the assault was most admirable. And there's the LST beached after they've made the landing. So this has taken some time after that, but you can see that's where the LST was unloading people at the battle. There it is, down, looking down the beach. So the fighting's moved inland by this time, but you can see the ship down here at the end on the beach as well. <coughs> now Gill is very seriously injured. Uh, 
the doctor that's on the, the ship with him starts a blood transfusion. Uh, he's immediately evacuated to a, uh, a, a nearby ship that has an operating room on it. He'll spend the next three months in a U.S. hospital in Algeria, in, North, in Algiers, I should say. Uh, and while he's hospitalized in North Africa, trying to re recover and survive these, these injuries, he gets a telegram that his wife back in Los Angeles, where she went back to be with her family while he's overseas, has had a girl, a baby. And they had agreed, he and his wife, that if the first child was a girl, she would be named Warren after her father Warren. So they'd agreed in that, so that's he gets that telegram. He has other children, but they're after the war. So he's back there. He's later sent back to the east coast of the United States. I mean, he's a little stronger to travel uh, for treatment. And his final hospitalization is on Naval Hospital Long Beach. Long Beach, California used to have a huge naval hospital there. Uh, he has numerous operations at each hospital that's there. He undergoes five major surgeries. There's a severe wound on, the, uh, on his chest above the waist. And in some of this, he's allowed to return home to see his, uh, his, his parents, his uh, wife and, and child. Uh, and he'll go back to Lebanon a few times for that. And he'll eventually be uh, released from the hospital. But people say that wound always uh, bothered him. And even 30 years after being wounded there, he was still changing the dressing on that wound mm -hmm. at home. So he's going to be 60 years old, still uh, changing that dressing. But apparently he could function OK. But he, it just continues the rest of his life. So he comes back to Lebanon on essentially a convalescent leave, I guess we call it. And even while he hasn't been real less, he's still in the Coast Guard, he agrees to serve as the chairman of the Lebanon Committee in the Red Cross fundraising campaign in February 1946. So here's a guy who's wounded, disabled, and he's still helping out raising funds for the Red Cross uh, campaign in 1946. And then uh, two months later, on the 1st of April 1946, he's medically retired from the Coast Guard because of a physical disability called a medical retirement. Now, because I remember he got, when he got the award, he was a Lieutenant JG, but all the time he's been hospitalized, people are getting promoted in World War II fairly rapidly, and he made it up to lieutenant by the time he was back in the US, in the United States. But there was a policy at that time that said anyone who was especially commended for heroism in actual combat by the Secretary of the Navy, which the Navy Cross different qualifies for, would be promoted one rank when they were retired. So they promote him to lieutenant commander, retire him as a lieutenant commander with uh, three quarters active duty pay uh, in 1946. And so now he's no longer in the Coast Guard. He's now a military veteran, which is who we honor this weekend. It's amazing what he does. Uh, besides running that fund campaign, in August 1946, shortly after being discharged and becoming a veteran, he publishes a little four or five page mimeograph newsletter called the San Vet. It's just a newsletter for Santiam uh, veterans of World War II. And he'll continue to serve in the coming years, his family, his community, and his state as many other veterans have done before him and still do today. And he gets involved with everything. He is, I call an energizer bunny, or he must have been doing all this. He also gets the medal that nobody wants to get because you have to be wounded or killed to get this. If you're killed, it goes to your next of kin. If you're wounded, you got wounds to show for it. And he even said that's the wound medal he didn't want to get. Uh, but that's the second only of the Medal of Honor there. Comes back, joins the American Legion, the largest veterans organization in the United States. Local Post 51 is in Lebanon, uh, the Legion Post. September 1947, the Post has elections and they elect this relatively new veteran, their post commander. Uh, and that's the emblem of post commander. Where is that? This is past commander over there. The, uh, he's a later, later elected to the 40 and 8. 
uh, which is a honor society of the American Legion. So the camaraderie there. Now, if you go to Lebanon today, there is a Legion hall there, but it wasn't built when he was commander. It was built in the 1950s, but it's uh, still there. He also joins the VFW post because by serving in overseas, he's qualified to join that. The reason the American Legion is bigger, by the way, is you have to serve in the military during war. The VFW says you have to serve overseas in a war to be a member of their thing. So if you never went overseas, uh, even if you served in World War II, you can't belong to the VFW. And even though I served 24 years, I never served in combat overseas, so I'm just a member of the American Legion. Okay. Also joins the Eastland Masonic Lodge. I mean, this is the town he grew up in, so he knows everybody there pretty much. And if I didn't know any better, I said, I think he's going into politics too, because you've got to get connections everywhere. He also joins the Lebanon Elks Lodge, number 1663. He also joins the Odd Fellows. Just about any fraternal organization that's there, he's a part of early on. I remember I told you his, he met his wife, who was a concert singer. Uh, in the early 1950s, he and his wife worked with Bill Thomas, another Lebanon resident, to organize the Lebanon Community Concert Association, which brought classical music concerts to Lebanon for 45 years. It's no longer there, but it does it for quite a few years until the 1990s. Also, and I'm still not sure how this got through, but I haven't been able to research the Oregon National Guard. Oh, also joined, I'm sorry, the Chamber of Commerce. He belonged to that too. He also joined the Oregon National Guard because in the local Lebanon paper, it says in 1950, they were starting a new, bata a new uh, battalion there in the Lebanon, Albany area. The 2nd Battalion, 7th Regiment of the Oregon National Guard It'd be activated on August 22, 1950, and that he would be the commander of this battalion with the rank of lieutenant colonel. So it's the state militia, uh, now known as the National Guard. And other companies in his battalion would be formed in Cottage Grove, Springfield, Eugene, and Coos Bay. So he serves in the state militia uh, in the National Guard for a while. He also enters politics. In 1949, right before this happened, he uh, decided to run for the uh, Oregon House of Representatives, which he does. That's the only picture I could really find. They look almost the same, except there's a different picture in front, and there's more desks in the House than there is the Senate, because it's a bigger house. So he serves in there one term from 49 to 51. After serving that term, he decides to move on to the Oregon State Senate and serves there a number of terms, District 2. So you can see there's more space between the desks there as well. And while he's in the Senate for those years, his committee appointments included roads and highways, the Veterans Affairs Committee, the Forestry and Mining Committee, Gaming Committee, or Game, I'm the Game, a Wild Game, Alcoholic Control, Elections and Privileges and Financial Affairs. In his final four years in the Senate, he was, uh, chairman of the powerful Senate Judiciary Committee, which rules on other all-state judges as far as that goes. So very active as a state senator. Uh, and in one of his campaign literature, when he's running for the nomination for governor, he uh, said he voted, he cast more than 37,500 votes uh, affecting the people of his home state. In fact, in 1957, his final year in the Senate, he nearly became the president of the Oregon Senate, uh, but a stalemate arose where neither by could decide between new candidates, and he decided to resign rather than have it just remain a stalemate and people weren't going to compromise, so he stepped, pulled his name out of the race. Instead, he decided to run the Republican primary, the Republican nomination uh, to run for governorship in, uh, for an election that was held in 1958, the year after, after he left the Senate. He was one of six candidates in the Republican primary for governor that year. And of those six, the party leadership was backing him. He had all this experience in the House and the Senate. They'd worked with him for years. Uh, but he didn't get it because there was another younger man running who was the Secretary of State, who was considered the, the bright, young, shining star in Oregon Republican uh, 
politics. That younger man would win the nomination, uh, win the nomination, would run as a Republican in that election against the Democrat incumbent, Robert Holmes, and he defeated that Democrat and became elected government. And at the t he was only, this guy, by the way, was only, was still, it was the youngest person ever to serve either as a Secretary of State, which he was when he ran, or as, the, uh, as governor. He would later serve two terms as governor and be elected to the U.S. Senate and serve for more years than anybody else as the U.S. Senator from Oregon. Anybody want to guess who that was? Mark Hartfield. Mark Hartfield. Very good. It was Mark Hatfield in his younger days and his later days. So that's who defeated him for the nomination. That's the only picture I could find of him. This is the time of the election. We had a, he had a uh, campaign literature, and I found a piece of it, and his picture was on there. But he's bald from a young age. But that's who uh, beat him up for the nomination. So at that point, he retires from politics, decides to vote his remaining years to serving his hometown of Lebanon. By the time this is occurring, he has uh, become the senior partner of a legal firm of Gill and Gonzo in uh, Lebanon. So he kept his practice going the whole time. He also was the owner and founder of the Lebanon Boat Works, a boat building company. He was secretary of the board of the Willamette Chipboard Company and secretary of the Lebanon Industrial Development Company, a board that had been formed to promote diversification of local industry. <coughs> and then in 1961, he became the Lebanon city attorney, a position he would hold until his death in 1978. Beyond that, he was not only was a, worked with small boats in the merchant marine, he would be appointed a member of the Oregon State Marine Board, two different terms. That's not what their logo looks like today, but that's what it used to look like. Uh, now they have a different logo, but I want to get the original one up there. And this is the board that regulates recreational boating within the state. Uh, in case you know, Oregon is unique in how states fund their programs. This board uses not a single penny of taxpayer money. All their funds come from people paying fees for register their boats, for fines, for fees to get a license or anything like else. Uh, other states, it's part of the legislative appropriates money for them. Twice he's served as chairman of the board, of this uh, uh, state board. And the first term he's on there, 65 to 73, uh, Lebanon is on the Santiam River, and he has enough influence to persuade the board uh, to build a public boat ramp on the South Santiam River and persuaded them to award a $3,000 grant, pave the ramp and the, and the area around there. And when it was completed in 1972, uh, they named it for him. They named it Gill's Landing because he's the one that got the, fund, the grant to do that. There's also an RV campground there as well. It is just at the foot of the Grant Street Bridge in Lebanon driving along and it's off to your right as you're heading east there. Then while serving as the chairman the second time, uh, at the end of his second term, he shepherds a grant of $40,000 to build a brand new boat ramp and floating dock there. Uh, and they dedicate that in his honor as well. And when they dedicated that time, this is the Santiam River back here, they put a big boulder there and let once you know this is Gill Landing and why it's named for him. If it wouldn't have been for Gill, they probably wouldn't have this landing that's there. Now, besides being involved in recreational boating, Warren Gill also liked flying. Spent a lot of time at the airport, had flares, friends as well. And so he decided he wanted to fly, but planes are very expensive. So he said, okay, he will purchase a kit to build a plane in your garage or your basement. We're going to do that. They do make small planes you can do that. It's called an ultralight little plane. And the one he assembles at his home is a little bitty gyrocopter. That's not his, but that's what a small ultralight gy gyrocopter looks like. Because it's not manufactured by a company, it's called an experimental aircraft. It's something you built yourself. And because it is ultralight uh, and, and you built it yourself, there's no license required to fly an ultralight. They don't go very fast, they don't go very high, 
Now, a gyrocopter is different than a typical airplane. Uh, it has a, the propellers at the back, and as it pushes the gyrocopter forward, this rotor is freewheeling. But as it goes forward, the rotor starts to rotate, and as it, as it rotates, it gives you lift going up. Now, my wife and I have a son who's a helicopter pilot in the Coast Guard, and I know enough, and I serve with uh, marine aviation, and they have a lot of helicopters too. And from all that experience, I learned that if you see a helicopter taking off straight up, that takes maximum power. The way helicopters like to take off is to be moving forward and taking off at the same time, because you're using a lot of power to go that way as well. Now, these are somewhat familiar uh, in the old days because they were used in a couple of movies. One of those is one you might have heard of. It happened one night, a 1934 romantic comedy. It stars Claudette Colbert, who plays a pampered socialite, who tries to get out of, under her father's thumb and runs away from a wedding her father has planned and arranged with another suitable, wealthy young man. And while on the run from her father, she meets a roguish reporter named, or who is played by Clark Gable. By the way, this movie is well known. I discovered it's the first of only three films. Uh, this movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and The Silence of the Lambs, that won all five major Academy Awards that year. And those five major awards are Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actress, Best, Best Actor, and Best Adapted Screenplay. So it got all five of those. And a very popular movie that I'm familiar with. And in that, towards the end of that movie, uh, she, her father finally catches up with her and she gets frustrated with Clark Glabel. She returns home to her father's big mansion and is gonna marry this person he selected for. And it's an outside wedding on their rather palatial estate and her, the groom flies in as a pilot. That's the groom, his name is, the character's name King Wesley. He's got a top hat on there, but that's a, a, a commercially made gyrocopter. It has a propeller on the front, but the freewheeling thing is over there. The, it's got more blades. It's a much bigger one than the one that Gil made for himself. So you might have seen that in the last of that movie. And then a movie I didn't see but found out about, another movie was called Mad Max 2. It's about a post-apocalyptic world. Uh, it takes place in Australia. Uh, and uh, Mel Gibson is in it. Gangs that are trying to catch him or do things. And he finds a gyrocopter nearby trying to escape them. Uh, essentially takes it away from the guy that has it and flies that in this movie as well. And this, in this movie, it's very similar to, it's more like the side that, that Gil had. And now you know what a gyrocopter is, I hope. And we basically understand it, I don't know, you might have seen one or something. Now obviously the one that Gil had is even simpler than this one. Uh, as I mentioned, it's experimental ultralight, no license required to fly it. But Gil was a conscientious person, so he took lessons on how to fly it used to taxi for hours on the, on the taxiways there. She get more familiar with it on the ground uh, before flying it in September 1987. And then he's doing a series of takeoffs and landings, what young pilots often do. How do you take off and land that? It's the biggest part of a flight anyway. Uh, when doing that on September, October 8th, 1987, something goes wrong. The engine stops. The rotor doesn't rotate anymore because I go forward. It crashes to the ground about, f about 550 feet in a field just south of the Lebanon airport, and Warren Gill is killed instantly, 1978. Uh, it, 87. It, 87, I'm sorry. 80, thank you, dear. What do I do without my wife? Okay. Uh, it shocks the city. It takes up much of the front page the following week of the Lebanon paper. Uh, shocks the people there as well. And uh, after his death, his funeral will be at the First Presbyterian Church in uh, Lebanon. The church he belonged to his whole life as well. And he'll be buried in the Odd Fellow Cemetery in Lebanon. There's his gravesite. I actually visited that. Uh, it's got his name over there and his wife's name over there. She died many years later, or a number of years later. And at the funeral ceremony, the, the local legion post provided the military honors uh, with a rifle volley and taps as well. It amazes me that nobody in the Coast Guard really knows about this guy. 
and he was, uh, and I'm doing the research for this. I want to take much of this and make it an article. There's a Coast Guard Reservist magazine for Coast Guard Reservists. It's, the Coast Guard Reserve is not too big, and I have, we have a son who's in the Coast Guard Reserve, and sent him, this is the only Coast Guard Reservist to get the Navy Cross, so I think they'll be proud to say he's their greatest heroes as well. But that's Warren Gill, a, a great hero of Oregon, a great hero of the Coast Guard. I hope people should remember this Veterans Day and other Veterans Day. I don't know any veteran's been more involved in his community than this guy was, so.